In today's video, we're taking a look at some NHL trade rumors, looking at teams like the Vancouver Canucks, the Toronto Maple Leafs, as well as the Buffalo Sabres, and could the Ottawa Senators be the next team to get a big help from the college hockey scene? We'll discuss that situation coming up next. So welcome back to another video here at Top Shelf Hockey. Now, as I mentioned, we have a variety of things to talk about today. Uh, of course, before we jump into the trade talk, I want to talk about the Ottawa Senators and the fact that they may be getting some pretty significant help on the way from the U.S. college hockey scene now that the University of North Dakota season has wrapped up. Even though they were the top seed, they failed to qualify for the Frozen Four, uh, really in a record-breaking game last night, which ended up going into five overtime periods. So they played eight periods of hockey. Absolutely ridiculous long period of time, but those boys must have been so tired at the end of it. Um, but the top seed, University of North Dakota, lost uh, to the University of Minnesota Duluth. So uh, clearly the Gophers have had a really strong team for the last few years. A tough opponent, uh, but the uh, University of North Dakota team was really strong this year and expected to go a little bit further. So that's quite upsetting for them. But of course, we saw University of Wisconsin uh, season come to an end today, a couple days before that. And we saw Cole Caulfield ink his contract with the Habs. Now the Senators are another team that could be getting some significant help because they've had a lot of draft picks from that University of North Dakota a program. Uh, many people joke and kind of call them the University of North Dakota Senators because they have a lot of guys there including uh, three different members of the blue line. So they certainly need some blue line help. We know they have lots of solid young offensively gifted forwards and they need some help on a blue line and it's coming in the form of guys like Jacob Bernard Docker who was a 2018 first round draft pick. Of course that's the same year they had uh, Brady Kachuk fourth overall. They had a second first round pick that year. Uh, later in the first round they get JBD uh, who really turns out to be one heck of a defenseman. Uh, after a few years now at University of North Dakota uh, he very well Likely turns pro is what people are saying. Uh, he's a right shot defenseman, good at both ends of the ice, uh, and many feel he very well could be, maybe not right away, but in the short term here in a year or two, uh, on a more consistent basis at least, could be the ideal partner for Thomas Shabbat. We know that the Senators are really missing that top pair right shot D to complement Shabbat, just like Mark Mathon to Eric Carlson. He needs a guy to kind of stabilize that pair and allow him to be the more of a rover style defenseman that he is and focus more on the offensive side of the game. So uh, could he be that guy? Only time will tell, but many feel he's got a strong potential to be that. And of course, they've also got Shane Pinto, who was a second round pick in the 2019 NHL draft. Of course, Pinto had a remarkable season, a really strong on faceoffs, really solid offensive guy. Uh, he does project to be a top six set. I'm not sure he'd be a number one but he certainly projects to be like likely number two uh could be a similar type of player to a josh norris to be honest um so they very well could end up being the sense top two centers here in a not too distant future of course pinto's got a couple of seasons now under his belt and many feel he's likely going to be turning pro as well uh, as far as their other options here they have a couple of other d-men including 2020 first round pick and Tim Stutzla, Jake Sanderson. Now, Sanderson was arguably one of the top players in that game last night, if not the top player. Uh, he played his absolute heart out. Uh, he looks to be like he could be a stud defenseman as well. Um, so at this point, he would probably form part of the second pair uh, on the Suns Blue Line in the not-too-distant future. Now, he's only played one season of college hockey where he just uh, got there after uh, being drafted this year. So it's difficult to say if Sanderson wants to turn pro or if he wants to continue playing and chasing another uh, you know, national championship here in, in the college hockey scene. It wouldn't be shocking if he stayed. And, of course, they also have Tyler Clevin, who was a 2020 draft pick as well. Um, of course, uh, he likely stays for sure. I would assume Clevin is not quite ready for the pros. I would think he probably wouldn't be offered that chance just yet. But Sanderson certainly will be, given how uh, you know potential of an elite defenseman he could turn out to be. So the Sens could be getting some significant help, especially uh, in uh, where they have only a seven-day quarantine period now. If the two or three of those guys were to get signed and come in, they could easily go down to the American Hockey League. They have a, a really big stretch of games coming up, the Belleville Senators. They could get a few American Hockey League games under their belt, and maybe before the regular season is done at the NHL, bring them up to get a small taste of that as well. That, that would kind of be the plan I would think they would go with. 
If they can do that after the deadline, they could probably move out a few of these vets that are likely not returning. Uh, we're probably looking at some guys in the blue line, like a Coburn probably goes. If there's interest, of course, there may not be. Uh, Erica Branson, another guy who very well could go. Anisimov, if somebody will take him, but he hasn't played a lot lately. Um, you know, so there's there could be some some spots there, and they can move some guys around to kind of get a better idea from a development standpoint of what they really have. So we'll have to stay tuned and see what happens here. But University of North Dakota might be giving the Senators some significant help here in the short term. So we'll watch that story over the next couple of days. Now on to today's trade talk. Let's start with the Vancouver Canucks. They have a lot of players getting attention here in the rumor mill that was discussed on Saturday headlines by Chris Johnson and Elliot Friedman, including defenseman Travis Hamannick. Now, of course, when the Canucks signed him, they gave him a no-move clause, so it's really up to Hamannick if he wants to accept a trade, and the Canucks knew this going in, that if they were going to sign him, it's a short-term, cheap contract. They know he's not going to generate a big return of any kind, so they didn't mind giving him that no-move. Obviously, it's important to him to stay close to family in Western Canada, and he's uh, not likely going anywhere but they have been getting calls apparently from the Carolina Hurricanes we talked about the Canes the other day that they wanted to add a right shot defenseman somebody with a little bit more of a defensive style physical style play and somebody who kind of fits the same sort of mold as a Travis Hamannick so doesn't uh, surprise me that that would be the type of player they're after based on what was previously reported but obviously he's not going to wave and he likely rides things out in Vancouver now if one of the other western Canadian teams came calling like the Oilers or the Jets maybe he would consider that but that would probably be the only teams he would even remotely consider things for. Uh, of course, elsewhere in Vancouver, we've also got Brandon Sutter, who apparently had been drawing interest from the Oilers as well. As I mentioned before, they're looking for a right shot, bottom six center riceman, somebody who can be good on faceoffs. Obviously, Sutter's a pending unrestricted free agent as well. If they retain half that salary, that's not so bad for them to uh, to make a deal work. I don't know if the Oilers would try to push Kyle Turris in any kind of trade, because clearly they're basically looking for a Turris replacement, somebody who can do a better job than what he's done so far so we'll see on that we also have guys like jake Vertanen and adam Gaudet continuing to draw interest as well uh those players are certainly not guys that need to be traded because of contracts expiring because they're still controllable assets however they're young players that the connects likely could move on from and get some fresh scenery and see if they can bring back some other young assets to kind of help out with the future here so uh, right now we don't have them linked to any specific teams but they were drawing a variety of interest from around the league here we've talked about them a lot here in the last month or so and of course there's tanner pearson who we did get some updates on uh, saturday headlines indicating his ankle injury is uh, maybe getting some better news than originally anticipated and he could be back sooner than he uh, originally thought he could start skating sometime this coming week and uh, very well could be back in action well ahead of the deadline which will be good for his trade value especially like i said teams are often you know a little bit skeptical of trading for an injured player because they don't know what they're getting and how long he'll be out and they're, they're going to request a lot of medical information that way but if he's back and playing it makes things a lot easier so the canucks i do expect to be sellers as much as they can try to continue you know battling for playoffs i just think mathematically it's pretty much going to be impossible and i think it's inevitable that jim benning and company will have no choice here um, but to accept their fate and uh, sell off some assets ahead the deadline as they prepare for a busy offseason some big important contracts for guys like Pedersen and Hughes and to really shape the future of this team they got to get make sure they can move on here from as many of these bad contracts as possible so that they can look after their young players and continue to build around them now some news on the Toronto Maple Leafs as well Elliot Friedman had some updates on goaltender Frederick Anderson based on some recent uh, interview comments from head coach Sheldon Keith it was kind of interesting and a lot of people don't really know what to make of the comments on Anderson's status, uh, given the fact that he's not skating, he's still going to be out for a little while. Uh, and basically, uh, Sheldon Keefe said that they were going to be undergoing some different tests and doing some different evaluations. I mean, the sources that the, uh, the Leafs, that the Freedmans talked to, says that they don't have any major concerns, at least at this point, that Freddie Anderson's season is over. Uh, so they feel he should be able to come back. How long he'll be, though, is questionable because nobody really seems to want to give any more details on what he's dealing with or what these other evaluations are, what they even mean. Uh, Friedman went on to say that at this point, at least, that it's not believed that the Leafs are actively in a goaltender trade uh, market right now and that they would only want to go into that if they really need to. And I feel like if Anderson was going to be out, that they would kind of get that feeling that they really would need to, or if they can put him on LTIR, even if he was going to be out for the remainder of the regular season, they could get some uh, insurance by uh, you know using that contract 
to, to find another goaltender to bring in. So clearly a couple of guys that come to mind. One would be, uh, you know, David Riddick in Calgary. They might be able to avoid a quarantining situation there as well because they still have games with the Flames in the next couple of weeks. If they made a trade when they're going to be playing anyways, there'd be no quarantining issues that way. So, you know, he's a guy with the Flames who likely doesn't have a long future with them given the expensive and long-term deal for Jacob Markstrom. So Riddick's a guy there that I feel could be available and could help them. The Flames, like the Canucks, are probably in pretty deep here and, and making the playoffs. I don't really see it happening myself, but you know, at this point, they're going to continue to battle and see what they can do. But I really think those top four spots between the Leafs, Oilers, Jets, and Habs are pretty much locked up. But there's still some hockey left, and you know, crazier things have happened at this point, so we can't write them off. But besides Riddick, uh, you know, there was previous talk about Jonathan Quick in LA. Um, you know, I'm not really sure that there's a lot. More to that, I'm not sure they've really, you know, continued those discussions. But according to Dave Pagnota, about a, a, was it a week, week, week and a half ago, that they, there were discussions around Quick and the Leafs. So we'll have to see here what they do. But I think it's a real possibility that if this is going to drag on too long for Anderson, that they could look to trade him or at least bring in some insurance if they can use the LTIR method of uh, getting that contract covered. So we'll see here. What Dubas and company do, they've been linked to defensemen forwards. Like they could end up being a very busy team ahead of the deadline. In terms of the Buffalo Sabres, uh, Elliot Friedman reported on headlines here that uh, Kevin Adams is basically, his phone's been ringing off the hook and he's getting all kinds of inquiries. They have all kinds of players that are generating interest. Primarily the big one is pending UFA, Taylor Hall, who many expect is almost a guarantee to be traded. Uh, obviously Hall himself has made it known publicly in the interview that he would definitely entertain uh, trade scenarios to waive his no move clause. And the Sabres at this point, given how bad their season has gone, really don't have any choice in my opinion, but to get some assets for him and move him along. I don't really see any reason to re-sign him. Uh, and if they were to consider it, I mean, I don't know what he's looking for in a new contract, but given what they paid him this year and how things have turned out, his value is certainly going to be down. But many believe that the asking price is right now a first-round pick, even though many feel that he won't fetch that for Buffalo, that the, the asking price is going to have to come down and more likely be like a second rounder and maybe a prospect. Um, not going to be a first rounder, at least not likely, given the fact that it's a bit of a buyer's market right now. And there's a fair bit of teams that have guys for sale, basically, and not a whole lot of teams that are buying compared to the ones that are selling. I would think that the teams that are selling are going to have to bring their prices down if they want to get things moved. And Taylor Hall is a prime example of how that's going to happen. Now, of course, he may not be the only guy generating interest. We already saw them trade Eric Stahl. They could move Golden and Carter Hutton, who's expiring contract, if there's interest, of course. And uh, one guy who you could look to that's a, you know, a little bit of a wild card here that could be traded. I'm not sure that he will be. It's going to depend on the offers, of course, or it could be a deal for the offseason. But there has been a lot of interest in Sam Reinhardt, who's certainly been one of their more productive players, even though it's been a ter terrible season team-wise. He's still being productive and still contributing to the uh, to the goal totals here. So he's still putting up some good numbers. So that shows you know how important he is to that team. And of course, the, the Jack Eichel situation. We don't really have anything further there. The fact that he's out further likely the rest of the season. Um, there won't likely be a lot of Eichel talk until at least we get to probably around the draft. But even then, it's just difficult to say. I think the big thing there is when Eichel wants to trade. If that comes to that, it'll happen. If he doesn't, they probably won't. But some people feel the Sabres might not have any choice but to trade Jack Eichel to get a good haul back to really get this team building for the future. And I've also heard some people say another big part of fixing the Sabres as well is they need a real good defensive coach to really fix Rasmus Dahlin. He has not progressed this year. He's taken some major steps back and not really having a good season. And clearly having a good mentor, a good defense coach there to really work with him should be one of their top priorities for the offseason to really shape him into being what they thought they were getting when he was drafted. I know I've seen people are already kind of slowly using that bust word. I don't think we're anywhere near that yet. He's had some good seasons before. Uh, I think it's just a, a combination of the whole environment and the team. If he were traded or given a, a different group to play with or whatever, some different coaching, I really think he can still be that uh, you know top tier talent and be you know a franchise defenseman for the Sabres or wherever he ends up down the road. But we'll see what happens. But the Sabres are getting tons of calls. Taylor Hall's name is certainly out there. And the asking price appears to be a first-round pick for now. But I would imagine that's going to come down before 
he actually gets moved. So let me know what teams you think are the most likely teams for Taylor Hall's services ahead of the deadline, and we'll discuss further in the comments. If you're new to the channel, consider subscribing and turning on your notifications so you don't miss any future content, and give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. I'd appreciate it if you did. As always, thank you for watching, and I'll catch you next time.